So uh, the next session is uh, one that uh, really interests me. Uh, I have uh, the subject's going to be transparency, and uh, we're going to discuss ethics, ethics and social responsibility. Can citizen science foster transparency, and where does its responsibility lie? Uh, I'm hoping Claire is there as well. I see Gaston and Nadia, and uh, Claire is there. Excellent. So. Uh, yes. Claire is going to be the, 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 the moderator for this. Uh, I'm just going to introduce Claire, then maybe I'll sneak in my comment. Uh, so Claire is a social psychologist specialised in risk governance and communication, an American and longtime French resident. Uh, I shan't try my terrible French accent. She has worked as a community or action researcher in almost every country, Europe and Japan and India. Claire has designed and facilitates programmes and platforms to support government and civil society organisations helping them to identify and move toward their goals to understand and govern risk and to create agreed recommendations to improve shared quality of life. I must say, I'm really, uh, you know, I, I wish I could be in every session. Um, I, I'm just going to tout a European project that I've got. Hi to CERN and Lisa. I'm lucky enough to sit on the ethics board of that project, which is looking at use of radioisotopes. So I, I shall be, I get my notepad out of things that I have to pay attention to and I'm really looking forward to the discussion on ethics. And uh, with that, over to Claire and the panel. Thanks very much, Ian. Um, yes, so we're going to be talking about transparency, ethics, and social responsibility uh, with my two panelists, Nadia and, and Gaston. Mm -hmm. We're old friends. Mm -hmm. I think that we may be uh, brought here in our 25 minutes or so to talk about mm -hmm. perhaps the impact of information and the impact of access to information and the societal meaning of different types of information and, and uh, information delivery. So the two of you have a, a kaleidoscopic experience. In a minute, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves. And uh, I'll be asking throughout our time together, um, I'll ask Nadia to ground us, if you can, in stakeholder views and needs. And I'll be asking Gaston to maybe lift us up from time to time into perhaps a more abstract reflection. So uh, I don't know if you'll agree with this, but uh, my perception of you, dear friends and colleagues, is that uh, uh, you you started out or you, or you were strongly in what we could say was the heart of the nuclear establishment in, uh, in Slovenia, Nadja, or in Belgium for Gaston. And, uh, you know, at some time in the past, you started taking some steps left and some steps forward and uh, found yourselves each a new positioning maybe closer to your, your own spirit. Uh, and it's focused by ethical reflection and, and especially by the notion of transparency. So please, Nadia and then Gaston, would you just uh, introduce yourself in a few words and, and tell about this uh, pathway and this positioning? Yes, thank Nadia. you. I'm very, uh, I'm very happy that I'm with you. Um, basically, uh, I'm coming from Slovenia. I'm physicist, reactor physics, and, but I have also a degree in uh, psychology. And uh, I am working in the nuclear sector 30 plus years in different positions from research institutions, civil servant, uh, the regulatory authority, then uh, the Agency for Rad Waste Management, which is a national waste management organization. Then uh, now currently I am at the uh, technical support organization. But besides, I'm also the uh, chair of the Nuclear Transparency Watch, which is an international association uh, combining many different uh, non-governmental organizations and other institutions or individuals who are uh, trying to improve the safety in transparency in nuclear area in general. So basically, as you said, Claire, I was doing with the uh, nuclear as a scientist from the beginning and then uh, adopt to the, through, the, through the interaction with the stakeholders uh, completely different to you. And now I think that we, we, we in nuclear sector, people in nuclear sector really need to, to change. And this is already ongoing and perhaps I will say something more. Thank you. Thanks, Nadja. Gaston. Thank you, Claire. Hi, everybody. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the I want to thank Safecast for inviting me in this event and to congratulate them with the great work they have been doing the last ten years, and also, of course, with this very interesting and enter entertaining event celebrating these uh, ten years. Well, yeah, backgrounds of well, I graduated as a theoretical physicist and, and a nuclear engineer, 
And then I, well, almost, well, no more than 20 years ago, I co-founded the PISA program at the Belgian Nuclear Research Center, the uh, program, the integration of social aspects into nuclear research, uh, because we want to like sketch a broader picture of the complexity of dealing with technologies such as nuclear. And then since then, I mainly uh, work as a researcher in ethics of science and technology, half time with the Belgian Nuclear Research Center and half time with the University of Ghent Faculty of Philosophy. And I've been involved, as uh, Claire said, in many European projects exploring the dimensions of, of uh, social science and, and, and humanities applied to a real policy, like, uh, for instance, in waste governance uh, and, uh, and also in communication. Mm -hmm. Yes, perhaps I'll uh, uh, step in here for a moment just to, to uh, say to our friends listening uh, where, we, where we met. It was 20 years ago, and I'm going to try to share my screen. Uh, in a, a European-sponsored uh, action research called COAM, Communities and Waste Management. And then this is the third edition COAM in practice. And we were working uh, to build a, a platform where citizens and uh, institutional representatives could come together and try to find out how to achieve inclusive governance of radioactive waste, waste management. Um, 12 countries in Europe, at least. And, and here are some of the conditions that we found that would be necessary to uh, achieve an inclusive governance. Uh, we also worked together, the three of us in the Eagle Project, uh, and we met ASBI uh, at the famous RICOMET conference in 2015, which uh, Tanya described about an hour ago, and uh, she described how ASBI's uh, news of SafeCast um, transformed the, the conversation there. So uh, I'd like to ask each of you, um, uh, first of all, have you have you been to Japan? Here we are over in Europe. We were in uh, Japan all night uh, with the SafeCast 10 uh, celebration. And uh, here we are in Europe. Uh, has either of you been to Japan? And what is your special memory? Nadia? Well, I was in Japan. Uh, there was even one event. We uh, held this, the, the, some presentation and lectures with ASBI. Uh, and of course, it's a different society completely for me, um, but it's, it's extremely interesting and uh, I, I had just nice memories to that. Gaston. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, maybe, and, and uh, to draw us maybe with my memory right into the, the discussion on the topic, I remember a very important experience uh, from the uh, a conference in, uh, at Fukushima Medical University in 2015. It was a second Asian workshop of the ICRP on the ethical dimension of the system of radiological protection. And uh, I was, we were, there was a, an expert panel uh, with radiation experts. And the discussion was about whether or not to return to the evacuated area where there was still like 20 millisievert uh, a year when you would live there. And, um, and there was one NGO representative, a Japanese NGO representative, asking these radiation experts, would you go back? Would you actually yourself return to that area to live there again? And the first said, I would go back. I'm 65, whatever. And the second said, after some thinking, no. And I think that was a very, very interesting eye-opener for citizens and for NGO people there in Japan, and namely the fact that a scientist who knows the science about radiation and health effects would also be judged, be influenced by his own gut feeling on the situation as such, which means that he was, they were like in unveiling the uncertainties around it and at the same time empowering paradoxically by creating uncertainties, by unveiling uncertainties, they were at the same time empowering the citizens, giving them insight on how they can decide themselves on these situations. So that's, that was my uh, most memorable experience in Japan in the context of the Fukushima disaster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, bringing, bringing a strong light for you on the many dimensions of decision, the many factors that can enter into decision. Uh, 
And uh, perhaps, uh, you know, those of us who study risk perception, risk communication, all of that, uh, you know, we, we, we can encounter uh, societal actors who, who feel that, you know, good decisions will always be taken if just the correct information is uh, transmitted. And if we look at uh, the Fukushima context over the years and uh, many other contexts, we see that it's uh, much, more, much more complicated than that. And there are individual decisions to be made and collective decisions to be made. Um, I wanted to share my own uh, uh, beautiful memory of, uh, of uh, going to Japan, which was in November 2012 for a, a joint uh, seminar, uh, connected a little bit, Gaston, with the one that you mentioned. Um, and it was called Science and Values, trying to look at how these different dimensions of decision information you know, uh, enter into individual and collective and, and, and larger societal decision making. And my very special memory is working there with uh, the principal of the Tominari Elementary School in Date City, uh, Satsuki Katsumi-san, uh, who told of how she led her community when they felt that they didn't want to be helpless in the face of what had just happened. Uh, they wanted to improve their conditions. And the friendship, the friendship that uh, uh, she gave me is, is my great memory of uh, Fukushima and of Japan. So we have been talking um, throughout this event about, about SafeCast and especially about open science, citizen science. I would like to ask you, how does citizen science, open science fit your understanding and your definition of transparency. And maybe you can re reflect on the idea of can transparency be achieved? And what does SafeCast contribute to that? Gaston, I'll ask you to go first. Okay, so transparency, I was asked to, to give some, a little of theoretical background, uh, whether of course I want to apply it to the practices in general and also to the, uh, the, the concrete case of Fukushima post-accident situation. Okay, transparency, we know the traditional understandings, it's uh, showing there are no double agendas, it's making public the liaisons between power holders and stakeholders, with the general public and civil society as the most important stakeholders in that sense, from a democracy, from a, from a democracy perspective. These uh, liaisons can be inter internal political relations, relations with the private sector and with civil society as such. Another traditional meaning is giving insight in how decisions are made. And then of course, last but not least, giving in transparency can also mean giving insight into how information and data is used. Now, I think it's, more, it's very important to understand that even in these traditional understandings, caring for transparency can still have two essential meanings. Um, the first one would be caring for transparency by giving outsiders, the stakeholders, uh, insights into the working of the power structures. These could be political authorities or private sector. And the second, I think, is more essential. It's caring for transparency by inviting these stakeholders into the powerhouse to participate in the generation of knowledge and decision making. And of course, this is where citizen science comes in. It's a move from caring for transparency to caring for participation. And it is very important to, 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 uh, to see that that invitation is not a privilege for citizens. It's a principle of right, as also Joke said in the previous uh, session. So, and when it comes to taking responsibility in the interest of transparency, uh, you may notice that in both cases, responsibility will still be with the power holders because they have to take the initiatives. In the case of citizen science, taking responsibility comes down to inviting citizens to contribute to official knowledge generation initiatives, or at least take their own, the initiatives of the citizens serious. And, and we, know that, right. we know that for in the, in the case of safe costs, uh, it was, I mean, because it was so well organized, the authorities started to take the initiative serious. And in the end, they started to cooperate in that sense. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, um, Gaston, I perceived that as you spoke, um, you, you have a, a very um, high principled concept of this invitation made to citizens. But of course, citizens don't always wait for an invitation. Citizens are, are living outside that door. They're not waiting for that door to be graciously opened. Citizens, we are here. And uh, I think that Safecast is, is, you know, we've learned a, really a wonderful story if, if, you know, you were able to watch uh, during the night and, and the morning of Europe. We've, we've seen the great story of, of how, how this, uh, this life outside the powerhouse is uh, full of, of power and, and agency. And, you know, I'm going, to put, course, I'm going to build something to put on my car to drive around and learn what I need to know to help my family. Any comment before we go to Nadia? Well, of course, this is true. It's a, but because of that, I precisely use the concept of the powerhouse. Uh, because mm. um, citizen science, um, all these bottom-up initiatives are wonderful. They're needed. But they are. When, when they are powerless in, 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 <laughs> in influencing, when they are powerless in influencing concrete policy, then, then mm. it's really a sad situation. That's what I mean. Okay. Nadja, this is a great time to let you and, and also maybe ask you to make the link closely with what Nuclear Transparency Watch is defining as transparency and how to achieve it. But please frame it as you like. Thank you. Uh, I just want to reflect on one thing uh, I experience in, uh, in the case of the repository site selection. Uh, it was organized uh, by the waste management organization very well, you know, open all the doors, you know, uh, providing all different information, participation, building trust and so on. But at the end, when the site was selected, it was just stopped with operation. And it was so disappointing for the local representatives and local population. So they are still having a kind of, uh, you know, uh, problems with anything related to the repository. Yes, and the, in the Nuclear Transparency Watch, uh, we are also a member of the uh, new uh, association of technical support organization. And uh, we see the, the safety aspect uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, citizens. So citizens were, is one part of the safety, assuring safety function. So beside the uh, regulatory authority, beside the technical support organization, and of course the license holders, whoever it is for nuclear power plant or for the waste uh, uh, management facility or whatever, uh, uh, it is, it is a new concept that the citizens and the non-governmental organizations are part to assure safety function. In saying that, uh, I think that this is quite a novel concept of understanding. And of course, um, by saying that citizen, does, it, has, it has a very generic uh, interpretation. So it has... Uh, uh, inside the non-governmental organization, the activists, the different uh, uh, residents, if you want, or those who are interested. And uh, uh, quite uh, recently, also Nuclear Tra Transparency Watch is now involved in uh, one activity, although uh, supported by technical support organization called Open Radiation. And we will also measure the data very very similar in very similar way and contribute to the mapping of the of the uh, ionizing radiation around the, the world so this kind of uh, possibility to involve people really uh, build on the trust and also enable um, the knowledge sharing and as you said you know um, uh, whether a top-down or bottom-up approach, uh, whatever, you know, people are there and they are, they are, if they are interested, they would do by themselves the activities. You cannot stop them. Mm -hmm. So I think that each of you does have a systemic view. You know, you don't have a linear view of, you know, the, 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 the empowered people on the top and the less empowered people on the bottom. You have an understanding that we're all in society. We have different roles. Yeah, Nadja? 
I just want to add here because now we are as NTW involved also in one uh, Europe, European level uh, uh, re research uh, program called EURAD. It's a huge program with, I don't know, 100 plus uh, organizations involved. And nuclear transparency watch is now there also to interact with civil society. And in the beginning, it was very hard to go in this, so let's say nuclear club, huh? but now we can see changes in the attitude, in the perception, in the reactions, in the discussions, you know, it is changing. It's yes, hard, but uh, it's this, changing. This, uh, uh, before I give you the word, uh, uh, Gaston, this idea of, of system means that, uh, you know, everything is, is, is connected in sometimes subtle ways and that there is there's feedback there. A change in one part of the system creates a change in another part of the system. And Nadia, you were portraying a, a, a context in which um, maybe all parts of the system are sharing a particular goal or objective, and that is safety or nuclear safety. Um, Gaston, do you have a word to say before I bring us forward? Yes, I want to say something more about the transparency. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, because uh, I think, and especially in the case of uh, Fukushima, as a good example, as an and as a hard reality, it can have a different meaning. Still, it is. I think there is a need to create more transparency around uh, the the existence and the use of scientific uncertainties on how they are perceived and dealt with, not only by scientists but also by policymakers and activists. And I think the best example in that sense is a case we have been studying. In, in within uh, the circles around the ICRP, but also within our own uh, research projects, is the case of thyroid cancer in children. Uh, we know that uh, systematic screening uh, of children leads to detection of cancers that would otherwise remain undetected. This is not only the case in Fukushima, but you would get the same result in any area in the world. We know that. So paradoxically, by trying to do good science, so the systematic screening, you create so much noise on the signal you want to measure that you can't hardly measure anything at all. So in these cases, it looks as if science remains perplex when it needs to advise policy. So especially under pressure to deliver evidence, science has to deal with uncertainties that it possibly cannot clear out within reasonable time frames. So and uh, it cannot really answer the, the simple yes, no questions. In this case, the, the question, is there more thyroid cancer in children because of the accident or not? But that doesn't mean that science cannot contribute. I think it's, it, it, it really, it gets a new role. In these cases, science together with the authorities should open up the method and invite citizens and civil society to jointly construct these hypotheses on what is actually the case on possible health effects in this. And I think this is the best way to generate social trust and I think this is perhaps the most advanced form of citizen science one can imagine. Hmm. So you're talking a, about a, a, a learning process, and it's a, a joint a learning mutual, process. A mutual, a joint and a mutual learning process, because also the scientists and the authorities will learn uh, in, from dialogues with the citizens, from their own assessments on what these health effects are and could be, and from, uh, they're talking from out of their own situations. We know that there was a lot of, of distrust around this uh, thyroid cancer case uh, in Fukushima. And, and by opening up science and inviting citizens and civil society to participate, I think you can really restore this trust, especially around this case. And of course, trust is not an objective in and of itself. Trust is one of the elements of that safety system that we've been talking about. Yeah, <laughs> we're not, uh, no one is looking for trust or if they are looking for trust as a free pass to do whatever they want, uh, that's not trust, that's not uh, going to build confidence in, in the safety system. Um, I'm, I'm also appreciative, uh, Gaston, of what you said that in this mutual learning process, which is done through interaction, through dialogue, through joint work on a third object, that uh, the, the, there's a need to, to learn together about uncertainty, about how we measure uncertainty, about how we deal with uncertainty, how we perceive and become aware of uncertainty and, and work around it. And I think that uh, in, in the last few sessions of the SafeCast 10 event, we've, we've heard uh, uh, a lot about how 
uncertainty is is going on is being um, addressed, known, understood. I want to to bring um, our conversation in in just the few minutes we have left uh, toward uh, the uh, what in French we might say the perverse effects of information maybe. And, and here's how, how I'll, I'll be framing it. Uh, we've been hearing a lot of reflection in, in the SafeCast 10 event about how more information revealing what we did not know or what we could not know before about radiological levels. Uh, it can help reframe understanding. It can help reframe decisions, whether they be individual, family, community, or national decisions. Um, and I was really appreciative of um, Peter, Peter Franken's uh, opening uh, reflections uh, last night for me, uh, where he said that the emphasis of SafeCast has not been on measuring, for example, indoor air uh, in my house as an individual, but the, the SafeCast idea is together measuring our common good, the air of our environment, our shared environment outside. I want to uh, say that, you know, okay, more information can reveal what we didn't know and, and help us make better decisions about things that are important to us. But more information also can destabilize our systems of belief. And here I, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, another, another reference, another book. This is something that you can find online. You can find this in, in PDF, Chernobyl, a policy response study. Um, published by IASA, the Institutional International Institute for Systems Anal Applied Systems Analysis, IASA, um, years ago. It's uh, and, and my husband, Marc Poumadère, has a chapter in this book on how it's called the credibility crisis, but it's about how the bad news of the Chernobyl accident broke a social contract because it suddenly removed the distances between uh, yesterday and today, and between, uh, for example, the safe consumer and the risky world of energy production. And we found, you know, years later, we all find that this same kind of rupture of a social contract, of a belief system, of the, the way we, uh, you know, face the world together, uh, the same kind of disruption was found, um, as the Japanese diet report said, when Fukushima Daiichi accident uh, threw away the safety myth, uh, the legend of safety. So I want to talk now about responsibility. I'm not at all suggesting that, okay, oops, ooh, you know, be careful, too much information. What, what they don't know won't hurt them. Uh, if they do know, it will hurt us. But I do want to ask you now, each of you, about responsibility, thinking about the effects of information and access to information. Mm -hmm. What are the ethical implications of measuring and of communicating radiation levels, whether it be done by governments or by citizens? And is transparency, I'm thinking about your definitions, is transparency always the right thing to aim for? And is there any argument against transparency as we think of this complex uh, world of effects of information. Please go ahead and this will be our, our ending reflection. Who wants to go first? Gaston, will you? <laughs> Gaston, well, <it's> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, okay, well, too much information. I, I don't think there can be too much information. It is, uh, it really depends on what the content of the information is. And, and we all know, we, we, I mean, we, we have, we are now in the era of fake news, as we say, so we can't trust anything anymore what's said, said on the media. So there is more mediation, more moderation necessary on, on, on really distinct from what is right from what is wrong. And, and, of, and of course, I give the best example uh, to show that this distinction is not, only, not always easy to make. Uh, so precisely because of that, because of that, because of, um, well, experts today operate from out of their own uh, social constructs and experts can so disagree with each other in public. Also, for instance, this happened in Fukushima. It also happens now every day with the, with the COVID crisis. When experts disagree in public, the general public will think that one of the two is lying, which is in most cases not true. Both experts will really 
build their own preferred hypothesis on the same set of inconsistent data they have or incomplete data. This is how it works. And, and precisely because of that, the public should get more insight into how construction of knowledge influenced by values works. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is why I say, uh, for instance, in the case of thyroid cancer in children, but with many other cases, uh, the scientific method should be opened up by inviting citizens to participate. Uh, and and the, 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 the idea that experts can disagree, the public for the first time got confronted with that fact now with the COVID crisis. It never got confronted with that so much in the case of nuclear energy or post-accident situations. And the, the authorities, um, and I don't want to deviate too much to the COVID crisis, but the authorities have a huge responsibility to really showing that science is what it is, that experts can disagree based on reasonable arguments. And it is not happening now. I mean, they're, they're losing again a nice opportunity to do it. And they lost it also in Fukushima, except for good initiatives like the ICRP conferences and of course, uh, the work of Safecast itself. I'd like to, to comment that we all, we all do know in our private lives and in our social lives, uh, we know all about disagreement. We know all about controversy. We know all about, uh, you know, conflict over facts and values. And um, it, uh, I've noticed that uh, amongst my STEM scientist friends, you know, my hard scientist friends, uh, uh, there's a growing concern with uh, how, how, as you say, Gaston, understanding, well, this isn't exactly what you said, but you brought up the scientific method and asked that it, that it be opened up to have more actors contributing. Um, but the, the idea that uh, uh, a, a certain uh, attitude and a certain habit of relationship to both facts and values uh, lets us cope better with violent disagreement, whether it be over the dinner table or in terms of a, a, a controversial uh, fact important for our safety. Can, can, Nadja, I, can I add one, one small more? Please, one small and then problem, it'll be all for Nadja. Please, Gaston. Yeah, yeah okay. and then yeah. Nadja. Well, mm -hmm. I've been watching, uh, well, of course, there were several conferences of the 10 years of Fukushima, and I've been watching some industry-led conferences, and I was really disappointed, and that comes back to what you said, Claire, to, uh, to see that there still exists these paternalist understandings of public under understanding of science. With radiation levels, even there, the idea was still that the people don't have the knowledge to really understand what's happening there. And that is, of course, like a right against the work what Safecast is doing. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was also, I was also disturbed by seeing um, the industry people being very self-confident in, in how they assessed what happened. I mean, they don't have to apologize in a way, mm -hmm. um, but, but it, some, some form of modesty would have been very, very, very good in that sense. Um, there were no expressions of apology. And what is even worse, there was no reflection on how Fukushima might eventually influence evaluations of the societal justification of nuclear energy as such for the future. There's the assessment really sounded as if Fukushima was just bad luck with some, lesson, with some lessons learned about technical improvements. There was no modesty, only self-confidence and self-praise with regard to how great they have been in tackling the technical issues. And I really found that very disappointing. Well, so again, there you see, again, yeah. the gap between the industry ratios on what happened and what we are doing here now in this event. Safecast, safecast volunteers, keep raising your voice, keep uh, proposing a, a different kind of conversation. Nadia, you're going to uh, take the floor for a couple of minutes and it will be the end of our session. Yes, please. Thank I'm you. afraid I, I, have to, I have to carry you on just slightly. I will be very short. I would just want to mm. reflect two things about the information. Uh, two things are that there are too much information. I noticed that some uh, um, regulatory authorities even are providing too much information, meaning 2,000 more pages of the very complex text and that they have in mind that well we we provided all the information and now we will see how they will handle it 
And mm. the, the, the other thing is that the private sector is not obliged to provide any information. So therefore, the, the only pathway to get information is through the regulatory authorities. And this is, again, very big problem. And I think that everything what is uh, financed but by the public money should be public, whatever, you know. And with this, I would like to, to finish. Uh, really, uh, involvement of people in the safety issues of any of this decision is most important. And when the nuclear uh, uh, industry will open the floor, uh, it will be much better. Over to you, Ian. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. A really interesting discussion. Thank you all. It's, I, I definitely don't think anyone can accuse Safecast of not having a very big tent. It's really been it's eye opening, and, and it was a really interesting conversation. And we have uh, to move on to the next thing, which is another video. So, if I could ask Mary for the cue, please. I'm Marina. I'm from Police. And I'm living in our they are my students, they are coming to Armenia, and uh, now we are together doing uh, some measurements with the big IG. I take big IG everywhere where I'm going, and I hope that uh, this uh, big IG will be helpful a lot for, for them, and uh, they will be informed about our, uh, uh, the, our environment in, in Armenia and also about the radiation level in the Armenia. I, uh, told, I learned about the big IG in Italy when uh, I was learned there. I took participation in short course uh, and the detail of Marco Zenaro, Jan Derby, uh, Joe Morris and Asby Brown, uh, I get knowledge uh, and uh, build this uh, equipment uh, and uh, I I hope that I will be some uh, uh, the kind of the lectures that uh, my students will remember me like uh, I am remembering you and uh, have a good meeting, interesting meeting, and I want to pass the uh, the, word, uh, the speech to my students uh, so they uh, continue uh, about uh, to impress their feelings about uh, measuring the radiation. So, Bia, can you talk? Hi, I'm Bia Matthew. I study well, under Miss Marine. Uh, she has given me so much interest into radiology. Big IG is, uh, this is my first time actually working with this equipment, and I'm so excited to be working with this. <laughs> and uh, thanks, for, hopefully I can work more time with Miss Marine with this equipment, and someday I can be like her. So, thank you. <laughs> So I'm Tojin, and uh, I'm a student of um, Dr. Maria in Traditional University. This uh, equipment, it was uh, really interesting to see, and she introduced us to this, uh, this instrument and all of this. And uh, we measure all the places uh, by radio, and we deliver the transition of the elevator plane like this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Agrita. I'm a student of Dr. Marie. We are very happy that uh, she made us a part of this. Uh, and like uh, everywhere we are going, uh, it's, uh, the amount is changing. And this is the first time that I am knowing that it's uh, too radiation in some place, it's some in somewhere slow. And I hope she will include us in our, her future, uh, like these projects. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Anaina. I'm a student of Marina, Dr. Marina. And uh, before this, we don't know about radiation at all. But right now, I think some acknowledgement about this we got all, uh, all got us. Then I think uh, this equipment is really nice and interesting. I think we all have fun today. <laughs> Hi, I'm Gopika. I'm also a student of Dr. Marina. I'm so really very excited to see this. And uh, I'm very happy to be a part of this and <clears throat> thank you so much and this was very interesting because we never know how much radiation is um, around us because uh, daily we are traveling around and by this uh, equipment we were able to know how much radiation is around us and all so it's really very interesting and i'm so happy to work a study with her thank you thank you so and uh, in the end uh, i'm sure the scientists the future uh, of uh, the science and uh, to know better about our environment 
uh, it's uh, one solution uh, to be involved in citizen science. And I cannot imagine the environment to know, uh, to uh, make, uh, the, uh, raise the awareness about the environment without the uh, citizen science. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice day.